Hey everyone, Michael O'Brien here. In today's video, I wanted to discuss with you guys five terms used in professional wrestling that I think apply to magic. Hello my friends and welcome back to another episode of Advice for Magicians, where my job is to make you the best possible entertainers that you can be. Now in today's episode, I thought it'd be kind of cool to talk about another passion of mine. Of course, I'm talking about professional wrestling, sports entertainment, WWF, or WWE now as they call themselves. Uh, you know, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson hitting you with that people's elbow right on Stone Cold Steve Austin. And, uh, you know, Stone Cold chugging back, you know, the, <laughs> the six pack and all of that stuff. I'm talking about sports entertainment, wrestling stuff. There are some industry terms that they use that I think can be applied to magic. Now you might be thinking, what does wrestling and magic have to do with each other, right? They've got nothing to do with each other. Actually, that's not true. A lot of the times, uh, sports entertainment, wrestling, will employ a lot of the same kinds of, you know, misdirection and illusions and all kinds of stuff to what they do in very much the same ways that we as magicians do. So in today's video, I wanted to talk about five industry terms that professional wrestlers use that I think can be applied to our magic. All right, the first one is cutting a promo. So what the heck am I doing when I'm cutting a promo? Oftentimes in a wrestling show, right, before a match starts, you'll see a wrestler will come down to the ring, they'll grab the mic and they'll be like, Stone Cold Steve Austin, I'm calling you out, you son of a whatever, you know, you get down here, I'm gonna kick your monkey ass all over the ring and this and that, and this is why I'm the best and blah, 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 and, rah, rah, rah. and they're like talking, they're getting the audience excited about what's gonna happen, right? When a wrestler is cutting a promo, this is where the storytelling aspect of wrestling comes from, right? A lot of the times during the match, of course, they're telling the story, maybe not out of their mouths, their bodies are telling the story, right? Um, there might be outside interference and they might get hit with a chair and then, oh my God, this guy got screwed over by this other guy and now he lost the championship or whatever it is. But a lot of the storytelling elements are built during these promos. Now, how does this relate to a magician? Imagine the wrestling match as sort of the magic trick, right? So when they go out there, they're wrestling their match, they're doing different moves, they're doing suplexes, they're slamming each other, right? These are like the moves and slights that we're using during our routine. Now, the storytelling aspect, like I said, comes from these promos where they're calling each other out, they're talking about why they wanna get the other guy, they're talking about what they're passionate about, I wanna be the best there is, there ever was, and there ever will be, and like all of this stuff, right? As a magician, a lot of the time, we go out and we have our wrestling matches, but we forget to cut our promos. So, what you want to do when you're performing is you want the audience to walk away having learned something about you. What's your motivation? Why do you do what you do? Why is the card coming up to the top of the deck 327 times in this routine, right? Uh, what is it about you that makes you you? You know, they wanna learn these things. When I'm performing magic, I do magic with Pokemon cards, for example, right? I would rather at the end of a routine, if the audience members are talking about what they just saw, Rather than say something like, oh yeah, the magician was really cool, he did some amazing card tricks and they were a lot of fun, I had no idea how they did them. What I would rather hear them say is, dude, the magic with the Pokemon cards was so cool and man, I loved that as a kid and it just brought me back to my childhood and you know, the way that the Pokemon cards ended up inside the Pokeball at the end, oh my God, that was so cool. Like that is more or less what I would like to hear from my audience. So when it comes to your storytelling, I want you guys to really focus in a little bit more on what is the message that you're trying to convey when you're actually performing magic. All right, the next term is botch. When something is botched, basically what that means is it has gone wrong, right? You might hear someone say, oh yeah, the wrestler botched that move or they botched their interview or when they were cutting a promo, they, they botched it up, right? Like, you know, it didn't, didn't go the way that they were expecting it to go. When you botch something, you make a mistake, right? And oftentimes, it's not about the botch itself, it's about how you recover from it that matters, right? 
So let's just say um, you were supposed to go up to the top and the guy was supposed to dive off the cage and through the table, right? But for whatever reason, he did that and he missed. He just fell down on the mat, right? How you recover from this is gonna make or break the botch, right? Now you can't get up and do the same spot again with the guy just like, again, laying down on the table like that would look silly, right? So a lot of times what they might do is something called calling an audible. When they call an audible, that means something went wrong. So now they need to make something up on the fly, right? So what they need to do now is they need to come up with a way to recover from the mistake that they made. And as magicians, it's very, very important, right? When you mess up a trick, you want your, to do your best to have an out for that mistake. There's been so many times that I've been performing and I'm just like, crap, I lost the pinky break. I don't know what their card is. I don't know where it is in the deck, right? So I'll just be like, is this your card? No, is that your card? No, is that your card? No, and they'll be like, ooh, watch, this is part of it. He's gonna find the card, right? I'll be like, no, 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 seriously, what card was it that you picked? Uh, the seven of hearts? Huh, that is very strange because I'm looking through this deck and I don't see the seven of hearts anywhere in here. Because you know where the seven of hearts goes? It goes pew, right inside my pocket. Oh my God, that's so cool. And in my head, I'm just like, yeah, I screwed up. That wasn't what the trick was gonna be, but that's what the trick became because I recovered from my botch by calling an audible and making the audience none the wiser. All right, and the next term is to put over. Uh, when something is over, basically what that means is the audience really enjoys it, right? If you talk about how a wrestler is so over, right? It means like, you know, they are just, you know, everyone loves them when they come out to their entrance music, they get a big erupted applause or whatever, right? An example of a, of a wrestler that was super over was Stone Cold Steve Austin. As soon as you heard that glass shatter, the audience, right? The audience is like cheering and erupted. He would come out, he would hit Vince McMahon with his Stone Cold Stunner. The audience would pop, right? They would make a big response and then he would walk backstage, right? And um, when a superstar is very over, again, it just means that they like that person. Um, so we can do our job to also put over other people, right? So oftentimes what a wrestler might do is when you say, oh yeah, you know, Undertaker put them over, right? Undertaker put Rock over. What does that mean? It means that Undertaker did his job to make The Rock look really good, to look really strong. Um, even if he lost or whatever, maybe Undertaker is selling for him, right? So selling is when you, um, you know, you're reacting to what's happening. So if I get punched in the face, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna react to it, right? If I no sell it, meaning not selling, and you punch me in the face, I just don't react to it, right? So when you're putting someone over or putting something over or you're putting a match over, right? You're making it, you're hyping it up, you're getting the audience to like it, you're making it look good, right? So as a magician, we can put over other magicians, right? A lot of times, someone might ask me something like, hey, have you heard of this magician? What do you think about them? I saw them on AGT. Uh, I get asked about Shin Lim all the time. You know, is he really as good as they say he is and all that stuff? I think as a community, putting over other magicians is very, very important. Even if you might not agree with a lot of what they do, you might think that maybe their sleight of hand isn't the best or whatever, putting that other magician over is gonna help raise magic as a whole anyway, because it's gonna get people excited about it. Oh yeah, that Shin Lim guy, dude, he's so freaking good. Like, I don't know how he does half the stuff that he does. That guy is like superhuman or whatever, right? And then putting over uh, the material that you're doing too. If you believe in your material, you can get your audience members to believe in your material as well. If you come out and you're not really sure exactly what you're trying to do and your material, uh, you're kind of, you're no selling it, right? You're just kind of like going through the motions or whatever and you're not putting, you know, you're not showing them how cool the trick is. Um, by, by selling it and by putting it over, uh, you're gonna make the audience a little bit more invested and care a lot more about what it is that you're doing. All right, next I wanna talk about a shoot versus a work. 
right? So when we talk about a work, uh, we're talking about something that's scripted, something that's planned, right? Um, for example, you might hear someone talk about, yeah, he's throwing working punches, right? Working punches are when you make it look like you're punching someone in the face and they're reacting to it, they're selling it, right? But you're not really hitting them in the face. You're getting really close to hitting them. Maybe you're stomping on the mat with your foot. You're making it look painful, but in reality, you're not even touching them, right? You're, or if you are touching them, you're not touching them. You're not hitting them hard enough that it's causing any kind of damage, right? These are what we call working punches, right? Another way that you can do a work is by um, maybe a storyline thing. <clears throat> like let's just say Stone Cold Steve Austin can't wrestle his match tonight. He's got a neck brace on because he actually got ran over by a car a few weeks ago and he had to have neck surgery and he's not cleared to wrestle because of his neck injury, right? Let's just say in storyline, that's what's happening. That's a work. In reality, Stone Cold is just fine, right? This is just a storyline that they're telling. So when you say, oh yeah, Stone Cold broke his neck, that's a work. It means he didn't really break his neck. It's just the story that they're telling, right? Now, a shoot is when something is real. It's not something that is necessarily part of the script, right? So for example, Stone Cold Steve Austin breaking his neck, Owen Hart gave him a pile driver, dropped him on his head, and he legitimately broke his neck. He legitimately had a neck brace put on. He legitimately was stretchered out. That was not a work. That was not scripted. Stone Cold actually broke his neck and actually had to go to the hospital to undergo neck surgery. That is a shoot. Uh, sometimes you'll hear wrestlers talking about a shoot interview, right? Where they're not talking about the behind the scene, uh, or they're not talking about like the script. They're talking about the behind the scenes stuff, right? So a perfect example of this is something uh, one of the most famous segments on wrestling TV in history is something called the Montreal Screwjob, right? Where Bret the Hitman Hart was supposed to win the championship and then he was supposed to essentially give up the title and then leave the WWF and go to WCW. That's the scripted ending that they planned. But what ended up happening was Vince McMahon didn't want Brett to win the championship and then go to WCW. So what he did was he screwed Brett out of the championship by making it look like he lost the match when in reality he didn't lose the match, right? That was a shoot that was not planned. Vince at the last minute came out and he said, ring the bell. They made it so that Bret Hart lost the championship and then Bret was pissed. He like spit in Vince McMahon's face and he flipped him off and he made the WCW uh, <laughs> logo with his hand. Uh, and he was, that, that was it. Like that ended his professional career in WWF and it ended his friendship with Vince McMahon all in one night just because of this thing that happened, right? So a shoot versus a work is basically um, something that's real versus something that's scripted, right? So in magic, a really good performer will do something where the spectator is not quite sure, like, is that, is that real or not? Like, you know, uh, let's just say you're doing a magician in trouble plot where you try to find the card and you're just like, I don't know where the card is. Like, it's not on the top, it's not on the bottom. I can't find it. Like, it's not in the deck, whatever, right? And the, the audience is thinking like, oh crap, did he screw up the trick? And then bam, you produce the card from behind their ear or something, right? Um, blurring the lines between what's a shoot and a work in professional wrestling is if pulled off can be done very well. And I think as a magician as well, if you can blur the lines a little bit between what's real and fake, like mentalists are really good at doing this, right? You're not quite sure if the mind reading thing that they're doing is because there's a trick to it, or maybe, just maybe, the mentalist can actually read your mind. And last but not least, kind of tying into the whole shoot versus work and putting someone over and selling and kind of really everything that we've just talked about here is a term that I really like, and this is kayfabe. When something is kayfabe, Basically what it means is you are protecting the magic, right? And that's why I think this term kayfabe kind of embodies what this whole video is about, right? Um, when it comes to uh, 
bridging the gap between professional wrestling and magic and why I think that these things are so, uh, so similar. So what is kayfabe? Kayfabe is the concept of preserving the illusion that what these guys were doing is real, right? Now these days, kayfabe is kind of not really a thing. Uh, you'll be watching wrestling and you'll be like, oh yeah, like Owen, uh, uh, Kevin Owens and um, John Cena were having a beer backstage right before this brawl where supposedly they hated each other and they want to kill each other, right? Uh, kayfabe, to be honest with you, is kind of dead these days, but there was a good amount of time back in the day, like in the early 70s, um, late 60s, where people thought professional wrestling was real, right? Where they didn't know that it was scripted, where they didn't know that the wrestlers were friends, right? Outside of work. In fact, kayfabe was so protected that back in the day, you had your baby faces and your heels, right? Your baby faces are like the ones that you're supposed to cheer for. And then the heels, they're like the, the bad guys, right? The ones that you're supposed to boo. It would be so bad that outside of wrestling, like if you were out at a restaurant or something and you ran into a wrestler, if that person was a heel, they were supposed to be really rude to you. They were supposed to be disrespectful. Uh, they were supposed to refuse to sign autographs. And if the person is a baby face, they're supposed to take pictures with you. They're supposed to be more than happy to sign their autograph. And they're supposed to be very friendly, right? They were really, really into protecting the image of the fact that what these guys were doing was completely real, right? So kayfabe in magic, a lot of the time, I think is something that as magicians, we forget to really preserve, right? And I'm not talking about revealing secrets online. That's another talk for another time. It's more just along the lines of the mystical aspect of what you do, right? I mean, we all know that what we do is sleight of hand and it takes years of practice, but I think going into it with the mindset of not trying to convince the spectators that what you're doing is real, I'm not saying that, but treating it in such a way that it feels real to you, right? When I'm reading minds, I'm not casually just like, oh yeah, yeah, you're thinking of this or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I read your mind. You want to treat this as a very special talent, a very special skill that you have, where when you're reading someone's mind, you want them to walk around feeling like, holy crap, that was intense. I have no idea how he did that. I don't know if he could really read minds or if he's psychic or what's going on, but you know, it's, it's crazy. And um, even something as simple as doing magic with a deck of cards. Um, Eugene Berger was really good at just conveying how thick and how deep the magic is when he's performing for you. When you watch Eugene Berger perform magic, you're not thinking like, oh, okay, this guy did some cool tricks. You're thinking, wow, like this is making me feel some sort of way, right? Like this is intense the different things that he's doing, the things that he's talking about. He treats something as simple as a deck of cards as something very special. He doesn't take the cards out of the box and throw the box away and here, take the cards, shuffle them, whatever, throw them to the audience. He takes them very slowly and carefully out of the box, gently sets them down, carefully tucks the box in, gently sets that down. And when he handles the cards and spreads them, they're just so gentle and so light in his hands. And just the way that he carries himself, he really feels feel the energy emitting from his performance. And I think that that's something that a lot of us could really do with. All right, my friends, that's five, technically like seven or eight, but that's five terms that wrestlers use, uh, professional wrestlers, sports entertainers, whatever you guys, whatever you wanna call these guys, uh, use in their industry that I think can definitely apply to the magic industry. I highly encourage you guys to go watch some wrestling stuff um, especially the older stuff, like from the WWF Attitude Era, if you guys get a chance. There's some really cool stuff that they do. Um, I mean, there's a segment where um, they put Vince McMahon in a limousine and they lift it up with a forklift and slam it and it blows up, right? Like, like there's some crazy shenanigans that they do. And uh, the way that the storytelling and the scripting all works together and, uh, you know, the way that they're able to tell this story and have people in the audience really really buying into how real this stuff is, you know? Um, smoke and mirrors and illusions and all that stuff. The WWF, you know, WCW, ECW, whatever, these different wrestling companies really do a good job of putting on some solid entertainment. And like I said, 
there's a lot more overlap than you might think. Uh, when it comes to professional wrestling and magic. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I've been on a wrestling kick lately. I just did a, a trick called Can of Whoop Ass. I put a tutorial on. It's got like Stone Cold Steve Austin holding a beer. Uh, if you guys want to go check that out, I highly encourage you guys to click the join button and become a member for $5 a month. You guys will get access to that tutorial and 70 other tutorials the time I'm making this video. There's 70 tutorials uh, in the tutorials playlist. You guys get full access to that. Um, there's other perks as well. I highly recommend you guys click on the membership tab if you guys want to check out what the different perks and different tier levels are for becoming a member. And if you just want to support the channel uh, and you guys enjoy these videos, I highly recommend that you click the subscribe button and don't forget to ring the bell. That way you know every time I upload a new video. But anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you right here in the next one. Take care.